we are delighted to be co-hosting this event with the BEC, but, um, and hence the video. But um, to explain more, I'd like to introduce our president, Susan Holt. Susan, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, this is going to be a very exciting evening, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from John. He's got a fantastic message for us. Um, about NBN capability and, and the growing economy. Um, but before I um, start, and while I have you all gathered here in the room, two, two messages. We have our business awards um, coming up. The business award is, uh, evening is coming up on the 14th of August, and nominations for the business awards are closed in one week's time. Now I would really, really encourage you to, and we do have some uh, nomination forms here, I would really encourage you um, to either A, nominate someone, or B, nominate yourself. This is a fantastic opportunity to recognise business excellence in Armadale, and we know where that got us last year. All the way to the top with Super Air, who went from winning our Business of the Year award to winning regionals, which, which was then based at, uh, the event was based at, uh, the evening was based at Narrabri, to then winning the New South Wales Business Chamber of the Year um, last year in Sydney, which is a most, it's a huge, huge um, event. So this is what we're all about. We're about, rec in, for this particular um, um, event, we're about recognising business excellence. And we do know that we have business excellence here in Armidale. The second thing that I'd, I'd remind you of is that yes, Tuesday we had a fantastic launch of our business skills audit. The Chamber has worked with UNE Business School <coughs> to craft a, an online survey where we are asking you as business people to tell us what your skills are, tell us what your uniqueness is, but more importantly tell us what you need to grow your business. What is it? It could be anything from upskilling via education to I need a, a, a corresponding business for X, Y, Z. Or I'd like to see more of la 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 in the mall because I've got customers and I've got nowhere to, sh to, to send them on a Saturday afternoon when they want to go for after shopping, they want to go and have something to eat. So I would encourage you also to participate in that survey. As members of the Chamber, you will have, have, you will have received um, an email with an online link. So I um, encourage you to, to partic participate and also your, your, your networks as well. Okay. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce John. Um, John... Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is what I do. I get carried away and then I forget to, forget to introduce people. I'm sorry, Mike. Mike is the Managing Director of the BEC. And um, Mike is, co is um, this is Mike's sponsored event tonight. And um, would you like to say something, Mike? Thank you, Susan. Just the, the, the uh, quickest and briefest uh, plug, just to let uh, the people of Armadale know that we, the BEC, have won a contract um, called the uh, Business uh, uh, Innovative S uh, Strategy. And basically what it is is uh, encouraging businesses to get online. There's overwhelming evidence for people, businesses that do get online and have a digital strategy. Um, they are four times more likely to be employing staff. They are growing at 20% per annum. So uh, and this underpins uh, John's talk. Basically, uh, uh, we have the opportunity to get online and be successful, and uh, we have the resources to help you do that. So thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, John. My speech is just as brief. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce John Walker. John is Macquarie Bank's Executive Chairman in South Korea and Head of Infrastructure of Asia. He arrived in Seoul with the bank in 2000 after receiving an Order of Australia, chiefly for his contribution to the transport plan for the Sim Sydney Olympic Games. He has subsequently built Macquarie as one of the largest investment banking groups in Korea with 20 billion in assets and major infrastructure progress projects to its credit. He has been cited by South Korea's president for his contributions and is a regular speaker at Korean universities and financial conferences. John has a unique perspective on how South Korea can credit at least some of its economic resurgence to fast broadband 
and he is here tonight to share with us some observations on the opportunities that Fast Broadband provides us. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. <coughs> thank you very much. Now, I, I, I should uh, thank you all for coming here on this, uh, this very cold evening. I, I know it's not as cold as it was last week. For me, it's quite cold because let me, let me tell you where I've been since last Sunday night. So last Sunday night, I left Seoul, which was around 36 degrees, and I flew to Tokyo, which was around 38 degrees. Then the next day, I flew to Jakarta, which was 40 degrees and very, very steaming. And then the next day, I flew to Singapore, which is where I came from yesterday, to Sydney and Singapore was around 36 degrees as well. So this is bloody cold for me <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm here and colder, yeah I know, I know, colder. So I, I should sort of excuse myself for I'm shivering a bit, I've just put my jacket back on and I'm slightly jet lagged but not too jet lagged. Slightly jet lagged after that, uh, after that uh, sort of long trip. Although I would have to say my typical week is sort of three, three countries in a week and you kind, of get, uh, you kind of get used to that. So look, thank you very much for coming tonight and I hope I, hope I can say something that's sort of interesting or, or, or a, little bit, a little bit stimulating. Uh, I think Susan, Susan's introduced me. I mean, I, I grew up in Armadale. So I, I, between the ages of four and I guess 20, I lived in Armidale on and off. My old man was a professor at the university. Every four years we would disappear somewhere in the good old sabbatical leave. Do we still have that? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Uh, but, but basically, I, I regard Armidale as my hometown. Michael Cragen is my oldest friend. We've known each other since four years old, right? And uh, so I, I should just say that about my, my background and these days I spend around four days of every month. This is my bolt hole. This is the place that I come to to gather my thoughts, sit back, yeah, get, get back in touch with, uh, with reality, if you like. So uh, I shouldn't be doing this actually. I should be just out at my place on the Rockvale Road relaxing, but it's actually a pleasure because I love talking about Korea and I love taking the opportunity to sit back and think about yeah, sort of lessons you learn from 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 different parts of the different parts of the, different parts of the world. I should just talk a little bit about Macquarie because it sets the scene a bit for the journey that I've been on for the last 16 years. So, the Macquarie Group of Companies is a homegrown Australian investment banking group. Believe it or not, it's in the top 15 investment banks in the world, and. It's prospered globally because it took an Australian homegrown technology to the rest of the world. And this technology is infrastructure finance. So it's the whole idea of putting capital together to build new infrastructure and develop new infrastructure. And this often gets lost, you know, when you, when you read the Australian media and they talk about things like Millionaire's Factory and all, all this kind of thing. It's actually a very proud Australian institution that took an Australian technology which, which helps investors basically put their capital into building new infrastructure. And it used that technology as a beachhead to develop in other markets around the world. So for example in the US now, we make more money in the US than we do in Australia. So Macquarie now has 14,000 people in 40 countries with about 60 offices, all based off this little Australian technology of infrastructure investment. And that was it's kind of my story. So in, in year 2000, I was sitting at a, a conference hearing a guy named Nicholas Moore, who's now the CEO of Macquarie, talk about the fact that Macquarie was so dominant in Australia. And in, as you guys know, in business, dominance is a very dangerous thing because there's only one way you can go, right? That's, that's the way you're going to go. Dominance means no room for growth, right? So we were, we were talking about that. I went straight up to Nicholas as soon as he'd finished speaking 
and said, look, you're right, I want to set up an office overseas. I want to grow our business overseas. Where do you think I should go? And he said, what about New York? I said, oh, no, 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 look, look at me. Do I look like a Wall Street kind of guy? <laughs> no, I'm not a Wall, I didn't go to the right schools. I went to De La Salle College in Armadale, you know. I didn't, I didn't go to all these uh, fancy, you know. I went to the University of New England. I didn't go to Harvard, you know, all the sort of things that the US guys think are important. He said, oh, what about Korea? What? He said, what about Korea? I mean, the, the government in Korea seems so determined to change things quickly and so determined to develop the country's infrastructure. And of course, at that time, I was thinking infrastructure is railroads and roads and ports. I didn't think about broadband. I do, I'm Australian, right? So I didn't, the first thing that came to my mind was not technology. It was something sort of physical. So I said, okay, Nicholas, I'll go and have a look. So, you know, I went at, I, in those days, I was the global head of government business for Macquarie because of my government background. So I was traveling around the world. So on that trip, I, I popped into Seoul in November, quickly came to grips with the minus 20 temperatures at that time. You guys have actually got it pretty warm here. And uh, you know, a week later I had an apartment and a year later I was divorced and life, sort of life, 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 life went on. The beachhead, the beachhead that we used to develop our business in Korea was this infrastructure beachhead. So I, when I, there was five of us, so it was myself and then I quickly hired four other people we entered into a joint venture with the second largest bank in Korea, and we began to go and see the Korean government, Korean construction companies, Korean pension funds and others, and we talked to them about how you could put all of this capital together and you could accelerate building the new roads, the new airports, the new ports, all those things. And it went really well. So, so and, and I'm not talking about this to Sky, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this as some context for, for talk about uh, IOT and, and ICT. So in the last 16 years, we, we grew from basically five people with zero assets under management to 300 people and now the largest foreign asset manager in Korea. So in, in the period from 2000 to today, we've grown from nothing to managing $30 billion 30 billion US dollars in that market, and 10 billion of that is infrastructure. It's roads and ports, but now I've got a different definition of infrastructure. It's also movie theaters, cable television, broadband providers, um, our largest single client in our equipment leasing business is Samsung Electronics. Our second largest client is LG Electronics. And these are kind of household names, right, when it comes to technology. So the, the, I guess I've had a chance, in, in many ways, this sort of truncated presentation about leveraging off broadband is about my experience developing a business in a market that benefited from not only just investment in, in, in the backbone of technology, but in investment in the applications of technology, if you like, the connections, the connections to, to the backbone. And without that having happened in Korea, it would have been very difficult for us to develop the kind of business that we have. There's nothing that we don't do that hasn't got digital in it in some way, and that's the lesson of the world, right? If you're in a business that in some way doesn't have a digital connection, you're in the dark ages, you're in the industrial revolution, right? You're, you know, you're burning coal, you're employing children and you're not paying them, and all the things that used to happen back then. So, uh, sorry, I've spoken for a long time about me and the business, but I'm trying to give it some context. Just in, in terms of career, there's no doubt, there is absolutely no doubt that they wouldn't have developed into an, an economy the same size as Australia's economy without this investment in technology. So when I think about Korea, I think about four eras 
I think about the 1980s, which I call the perspiration era. And that's the career that many of you guys might think of. So that was the career that used to make steel. It built cars. You know, it, it, it was hard working. They were, they were very dedicated followers. They always followed the leader. And they were quite militarily focused and, and sort of businesses operated like military organisations. The person at the top said, I want one of them and thousands of people would run around and go, even if it made absolutely no sense at all, they would go and get that chairperson and see you know, what that person wanted. So that was the 1980s. Uh, it, in the 1980s, career was receiving aid. Its GDP per capita was less than the Philippines. And basic telephony was not broadly available. You think about it, in the 1980s, it, not many homes had telephones in Korea. The period from the year 2000, the, the few years from period year 2000, which is when I arrived, I call that the, uh, I guess the inspiration era. So in that period, a lot of these sweaty, hard-working manufacturing businesses had begun to evolve. And th there's, a, there's a really basic North Asian business characteristic. They don't think like us. We think in a very linear way, right? We go along online, we're very logical. This point connects to this point, to this point, and it all has logic. North Asian people don't think that way. They think, if you imagine a, a circle with a whole lot of unconnected dots in it, that's the way they think. But that's led to this idea of adjacency. So when you think about, so when they think about their businesses, they think about what can that lead to over here without the constraint of logic. So companies that, that were just say a in, in, in the 2000s in this inspiration area, for example, POSCO, which was at that point the fourth largest steel maker in the world, began to evolve into a technology company. Right. Now the reason, the reason they started to evolve that way, uh, Kumho Asiana was a bus company. It began to evolve into a chemicals and airline company. Samsung was a farmer, but they began to evolve towards communications technology. Now the reason they could do that is that in that uh, sweaty period, in that perspiration, just making things period and following the rest of the world, the government in 1995 decided that it would, it would, it decided we will have national broadband. We will roll out a national broadband all across Korea and we'll do it in five years. And they did it. They did it. So in, the, in, in that period from 95 to 2000, when they did that, they provided an opportunity for this natural business characteristic of adjacency to emerge. So the farmers began to develop technology. Do you remember, you know, people of my age or a little more would remember something called Lucky Gold Star. Yeah. Really super cheap electronics, remember that? Well, that's the LG group. But the LG group, before they started to try to sell stuff here and the Samsung group and other in that period, in this inspiration period, sort of on the cusp of perspiration and inspiration, began to use their home market as a test bed. And I think this is, this is really important, the idea of using your market as a test bed for a new product or a niche product. And I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to go way over time here. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then from 2009, Korea moved into what I call the aspiration period. So this inspiration that the financial institutions started to develop, they were largely developing because of technology too. Online banking, absolutely amazing. And at this, this period from inspiration to aspiration, Korea began to develop into an international, an international investor, an international business enterprise. So in that, imagine this, by 2009, Samsung Electronics annual, its size, the, the, the market capitalization in sort of a banking sense, 
in the mid 2000s was 16 billion dollars, no, 16 billion US dollars. So it, it's now 206 billion US dollars. So 16 billion to 206 billion in way less than a decade. And this is what happened during this aspiration period. All of the, t the, the testing that they were able to do in their communities because of the technology that was available to them to develop their products paid off because they then took all of the results of that testing to the rest of the world. You know, and just, you know, Samsung Electronics is now a household name. A lot of people still think it's Japanese, you know, but, but it's not. It's Korean. And, and look, where we are now, I call this era that we're in now, so we've gone from perspiration to inspiration to aspiration. I call this transformation. So Korea, now what it, last year it hosted, hosted the G20. Uh, groups like SK, LJ, Kumho, CJ, all of these guys now are global household names. They're global champions. And they're all here. They're all here in Australia as well. They're, they're, they're all around the world. So it's an amazing story from, and in fact the, the presentation that I gave at UNE a few weeks ago, I, I decided to call, this is, we can send copies of people here, said, I call it the miracle on the Han River. It's absolutely a miracle, absolutely incredible what these people were able to achieve. So I guess, I mean, the, the, thing, the thing that comes through for me um, then as to why this was all so successful. And you know, there's, a, there's so much detail about the stages. What, what the, gov the role of government was really fundamental. And we just, in this area of major infrastructure, you know, provision and application of major infrastructure, unfortunately, you can't take government out of the picture. It's, it's, ju it's just the reality. But the question is, how can government best do what it it needs to do. And the thing that I observe a little bit about Australia is that you know the federal government has been very active in putting money into developing MBN. But that sounds a little bit like build it and they will come. And that doesn't actually work, right? So what what they did in Korea, which was very smart, is they yes, they put about a billion dollars into rolling out broadband. You know, Korea is much smaller geographically than Australia. It, it's more complex because there's mountains and marshes and things. It put a huge amount of effort into the connection, the connections to the broadband. So it had programs where it, it, it educated 10 million Korean people on how to utilise technology. It, it, it forced, it, it actually forced the industry that uses broadband to do things it needed to do. It didn't give the telco providers or others the option. It regulated them to ensure that its customers would get the benefit. So you didn't have a situation in Korea where you'd ring up and say, Telstra, I haven't got my MBN yet. And Telstra would say, well, that's not our problem. Go and see MBN. And you didn't ring MBN and say, I haven't got it yet. And they'd say, well, that's not our problem. Go and see Telstra. They didn't allow that to happen. That's just sort of one example. Since I gave the preso at the uni, MBN surprisingly turned up and connected me and everything's good now. <laughs> and Telstra came out and helped them on the day. I did have a little shot at them. But I mean, that's just one example. So there was, there was a, and there was a lot of investment. The, 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 the government actually gave money to private companies. So it didn't just put the money into the physical infrastructure, but it gave money to the private companies that had the customers, that had the ability to utilize this infrastructure. The other thing it did is that, is this word leadership, right? So it didn't just lead with money. The other thing government did, and has done it hugely successfully, is that it utilises, it developed programs and policies to utilise technology in a way which provided opportunities to the small to medium enterprises. One of the big challenges for Korea is that its economy has traditionally been dom dominated by a group called Chebol. Uh, Chebol, they're the corporates. And that they have traditionally dominated and the SME sector has suffered. And that's a big structural issue. 
So one of the things broadband has done, it's allowed government to address those structural inefficiencies. So the government has a, 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 a national e-procurement system where it's assisted the SMEs to utilise that system. It's assisted the technology, the communications technology of the SMEs who provide services to government to utilise the government system. So it was an all-encompassing system. They did, government just built, didn't build it for itself and then wait for some person out there that made widgets that went into the Department of Finance or something. But it developed it with that company. So embraced the SME sector so that it, it, it could benefit from that. Hardly anyone in Korea lodges a tax return the way you do in Australia. 90% of Koreans lodge tax, tax returns on, a, on a, a, a communication system, a government online system. One of the big issues, and I think I said this, and I've got to look around the room here. I mean, I always think to myself, what's the most corrupt country in Asia? You know, uh, and you know, Korea was pretty well close to the top of the list back in the 80s and 90s. We were talking about that earlier. Um, it's very, very difficult to do things in a non-transparent way when it comes to tax in Korea. Just everything's online, right? Everything's online. So it, you know, this, this ability, the, the, the leadership the government took in developing a tax system which would force itself to be transparent has had enormous benefits for the business sector and enormous benefits for, for, for people generally. So the government has led by example with a few of these things in, in its role. So it just hasn't built it, walked away and left it to everyone else to work out. And so that's, I think that's been one of the fundamental, and I could give you countless other examples of the sorts of things it's done. That's been one of the fundamental things. The other thing that's been really successful in Korea is the role of communities. So communities you know, such as ours here, for example. And some examples that I can think of there is that communities have, uh, some of the, particularly some of the more isolated uh, rural communities, have been able to harness this broadband and then all of the education that went with it and the con investment into connectivity and other things that went into it to create these little mini regional uh, connected economies. So fishing and farming communities now have logistics and marketing businesses on a regional basis for their products. And they're proving very, very successful. And they're, 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 you know, they're marketing uh, fish, niche fish products and niche rural products from different parts of the country to other parts of the country and internationally as well. And this wouldn't have happened without the benefit of being able to connect and establish these business, business communities. And they've done, the thing about the Koreans, they don't just sit back and wait and say, okay, the government's, something magical's gonna happen here. The government spent all of this money on broadband, but they, it's this adjacency thing again. How can I turn, my, I go out every day in my fishing boat and I catch these fish. If I digitalize what I do, can I sell them for a better price? Or if I market them as part of a community that's got mushrooms, can, I, can, I, can we sell more? Can I get a better price? Can I? And that's sort of how it, it works. So, you know, as I said, Samsung were farmers. It's just one, and, but they needed some logistics. They needed to communicate what they had. So they were able to adopt the technology that was offered to them when the broadband came in. So the role of communities has been uh, has been extremely important in the success of what's happened in Korea. And I guess, you know, the role of business and, and what business has done is it's really taken this test bed idea and, and made, it, made it an art form. But when, when I take another step back, I think, you know, wh why have they been so successful? It's been the fact that those three constituencies all worked together. And you know the role of uh, the role of uh, academia in this is important as well. Martin and I have been talking a bit about the leading technology university in Korea called KAIST, uh, and and the role it's it's played as well. In fact, we're going to connect you and E with KAIST in October. Martin's coming over, and we're going to meet with them and see what we can do together. 
So this, the fact that all of these different sectors has work, have worked together cooperatively, you know, business and government in the, in the broadband rollout, business in government and communities all together has been, I think, a, a really important ingredient to the success of the country. So to the, les the lessons I've guessed that I've seen is this, this issue of adjacency, uh, the, the, the communities, the other thing is, is there's a Korean expression called bali bali, bali bali. It means quickly, quickly. The other thing has been this sense of urgency to do something with this opportunity that we're given. They just haven't relaxed and, and sort of waited for something magical to come, you know. It's just saying, it just haven't sort of sat back, oh great, we've got broadband now, world's going to be fantastic but I'm just going to keep running my plumbing business as I do. And the only <coughs> advertising I'm going to do is on the side of my truck when I drive down the street. I hope someone sees it and I'll get some business. No, it's sort of like, how can I get, how can I get my name out there? Who can I work with? What other communities can I connect with? How can I establish a virtual economic community that I can become part of and lift myself out of just being part of the traditional economic community which is about a different form of advertising and a different form of, 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 of collaboration. So that's been really important. So yeah, I guess they're all sort of the success, all the success factors. Um, sorry, this is very quick and it's really <laughs> very high level. Um, so the other, the other thing uh, when I was uh, presenting the other month at UNE is I was, I was, I was trying to think, well, you know, what, what lessons could there be for New England and what, what opportunities could there be in New England? And I, and I was saying this with absolute ignorance as to what you guys were already doing, right? So, and I know that there is already a lot happening. But having been away from the place for a long time, I guess you can just forgive me for being a little ignorant about what is and what isn't happening. And the sort of things that I was that I was thinking about at that time, and I used this this slide, which I called uh, New England specialisations, because I was thinking about thing about niches. I was thinking about my business. So I wouldn't have built my business from zero to thirty billion dollars if I didn't have a niche, and it was that infrastructure finance niche, right? Samsung wouldn't have taken its business from where it was then to where it is today without having the niches that are developed with its test bed, test beds products. So I was thinking, well, I mean, one of them, one of them obviously is agriculture, right? And there's there's nothing particularly new in that. And I was thinking about things like remote sensing. You know, the 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 the, the ability to you know manage significant agricultural operations from, you know, not necessarily being out the back in the shed, but you can do it some hundred kilometres away, there, there must be something that, that regional Australia, particularly this rich agricultural region, could think about there. I was thinking about marketing networks when I was thinking about the community example of the, the marketing and logistics connectivity that they're able to achieve. You know, does, does New England have a virtual marketing network and does it connect with other networks throughout Asia and other parts of the world? Can you real time you know, wake up in Seoul and then connect with a farmer that grows quality beef and ensure that despite the various marketing mechanisms that you get access to that product? I think the answer is no. Not at the moment. Sorry? Sorry, not at the moment. Not at the moment, yeah. Um, logistics, supply chains. I can't, uh, I can't, I was sitting on the plane yesterday trying to think of some other things that I can't actually uh, read my own writing, but you know, obviously agriculture, <laughs> which is not surprising, I don't have very good writing. You know. you know, <laughs> as long as I can see the numbers. The other, <laughs> by the way, this guy knows how to set a guitar up. He really knows how to set a guitar up. So and then I was thinking about the arts as well. Now I'm a, I'm a member of the board of uh, the New England Writers' Centre and I'm actually a sponsor. My, well, my family foundation is a sponsor of that centre. And, you know, they have a fantastic product. They have a great technology. They, they have a technology where children in remote communities can learn about writing. Right? It, it's, it's, a, 
a live connection. So a well-known author will be talking directly to the kids and, and passing on their, their, their knowledge about writing and the approach to writing. Now, this is a great niche for New England. I, I always was very proud of the fact that Judith Wright lived in Woolamumby. And Jude, um, uh, uh, Miss Masson lives here now. Sophie Masson lives here now. She's a world quality, world known author. So the arts is a bit of a niche. And in fact, one of your local organisations has already developed a product that if you could develop that on an international basis and sell it basically, that it's a great example of what could be happening with the arts. I don't know, there must be some similar thought with, with, with Neram. I, I don't know, there must be, but I think next generation media, you know, Tamworth's the country music capital, but do they do digital remastering of music? Do they, do they, do they have the technology element or the digital element, or is it just about turning up to a festival every year and having people performing all over the city? We're only an hour away from them. Now, the Korean wave is an amazing thing. You know, the highest ranking soap operas in China, Hong Kong, Thailand, Taiwan, are Korean with subtitles. <laughs> the fastest growing content providers in the world are Korean. And it's all from this, Forget about, oh sorry mate, I know you're the head of IT. I know you're the head of IT at UNE. Don't use the words IT anymore. You've got to use the words IOT or ICT. Info information Communications Technology or the Internet of Things. IT is just the hardware. So ICT, IOT, that's why Korea now is, you know, the Korean wave is just amazing. Everywhere you go in North and Southeast Asia, it's all Korea, Korea, Korea. So here we are, an hour from the country music capital with some talented people in the music sector. Why not digital remastering? I dabble a little bit in music, and in a moment I'm going to give one of you an opportunity to win my CD from, from last year. But I think, so I think the arts, there's something about this region, something about the confluence of agriculture academia, the arts, that, that makes a bit of sense for a niche. And if you're thinking about that in IOT, ICT sense, I'm, I'm sure there's business opportunities there. Education is obvious, you know, online education, virtual universities, virtual teaching, you know, students less and less are actually turning up to go to university. It's just reality. I think the opportunity, and this is why I'm aggressively backing you know, in a business school here, I think the opportunity is to create a virtual regional uh, university or business school. You, you know, th there's no reason why it needs to just be a particular country or a particular region, but if we could team up with universities around this region and create this virtual product where PhD theses can be supervised by universities in three different countries with the online courses there's a centre for Australian studies at Yonsei University in Seoul, for example, and in a number of Chinese universities. There's no reason why Martin can't be lecturing to them as part of this new virtual university with virtual revenues and virtual profits and all of those things. It's a much bigger world and it's all adjacent. It's just building off. And, and I think the opportunity is there to link up with regional universities in particular because another niche that we have here is that we are regional. In, bring it on? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, environmental industries. This is an incredibly clean region. This is an amazingly clean region. I'm so disappointed that when I go down to Ebor or sort of go around, I don't see any German backpackers. Yeah. I don't see any Chinese backpackers. I don't see any Japanese backpackers. One of the great things uh, one of the communities in Korea has done is that they've designed a virtual tourism package. So, so if you're a, a, a young uh, backpacker from, from Germany that wants to go walking somewhere in a very clean area, 
you go online and you have your tour. You walk up the trails, you see the old castles, you, you know, you go into the valleys. You do it all online and you get a chance to sample it and see what it's like. And it's, you know, if, if you're faced with the choice of reading a sort of a, a, a vanilla brochure or you actually get a chance to have a live tour, you know which one you're going to pick, right? Because you, you, you get a much better sense of the experience that, that, that you're going to get. The other thing they've done then that they've developed on from that is that when you actually are at the location, when you're doing your tour, you've got a guide with you. Right? You, so you've got your smartphone and you say, well, and if you turn a little further to the left, you'll see, ah, Dangers Falls. And here's the history of Dang oh, Hillgrove, the, the history of the mining district. It just makes it a much more attractive experience. And it's all about communication. Again, you've had a taste of it before you get there. But while you're there, you're being, you're being guided. So environmental industries, eco-tourism, you know, all of these sorts of things. And then, of course, the other one is medicine. The other one is medicine. So I'm really great. I mean, because the big thing that's happened since I was a sort of full-time Armadale person, the big thing that's happened, of course, is that UNE now is a medical school. And it's developing that school and developing that school and developing that school. I think, you know, that is a fantastic opportunity to talk about things like remote, remote medicine and... Uh, I was talking to a friend the other day that was feeling really sick in the stomach and first, just as an experiment, she went online and had herself analysed online and it got worked out and, and within a few hours of that analysis, a courier turned up with the medicine that she needed to take. Now, you know, regional medicine is a big challenge. I do, I read remotely that, you know, from that antiquated dinosaur of a publication called the Armadale Express. I, you know, I can't, I was saying earlier, I can't make the pictures bigger. I can't, like it's the most unfriendly interactive thing. You've got, if you've got a city newspaper and you're going to leverage off bloody broadband, you can't have this thing, like it's clunky. It's very, very, very clunky. Is anyone from there? I mean, it's, it's I, I love, every night I read it. But then I pick up all the other newspapers and I can make the pictures bigger, I can do all sorts of interactive things with them. Got to fix that. Like we've got broadband here now. Got to fix the Armadale Express and the other one. Oh, the other one. It's gone. All oh, right. It used to have some good real estate ads until your company pulled out of it, I think. You're probably, you're probably the one that killed it, Jeremy. I don't know. But anyway, met, sorry, the, but my point, is, my, my point is on medicine. I think it's got to be an opportunity. And one just crazy thought I've had is why not try to introduce into that school oriental medicine? Because again, you know, we are part of this region. So why not try to connect specifically with a number of the oriental medicine universities in the region? Because if we want thousands of Chinese students here, not just the hundreds that we've got now, I tell you what, that's one way of doing it. That's one way of doing it. And, and these kids will all rent houses, they'll go to the shops, they'll buy clothes, they'll, they'll do all of that sort of stuff. So I think if someone could take that message back. Aren't they doing it online? I thought your earlier point was that it was all going online. Yeah. And then you just said that there'll be heaps of bodies here. Yeah, well, well, I, think, I, think, well I think with Chinese medicine there has to be. Right? I think it's very different because it's, it's about taking the raw materials and chopping them up and it's not just about the analysis but it's about the prescription. So you're right, it's probably more about the pharmaceutical side of Chinese medicine and then there could be opportunities for the farmers here to grow the products that go into Chinese medicine. So adjacency, this is point about adjacency. I think, I think I've been going a bit too long. Look, there's some thoughts I had based, it's a very potted history, I, I hope I've got uh, some, some, some of the message through. And I guess the biggest message for me is I, I couldn't have imagined a world 16 years ago where you just had, there had to be <coughs> the internet of things or information communication technology in any business, no matter what kind of business it is. And, and the more I think about it, the more I think that, that, that our niche as a region here if we could find a way of creating a regional community in this region, so, you know, Indonesia, 
the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, all have regions that have got similar. And, and there's an opportunity to c connect with them. They have a lot of things, they need a lot of things that we have. They need money. A, a lot of my job is out there trying to find ways to raise capital to build the railways and the hospitals and the schools and things. That's what I do, that's my sort of job. But they need a lot of other things and there's a lot of specialisations here that you could be selling into those emerging regional communities. And you could even imagine, I mean you could even imagine plumbing businesses and electronics businesses, not just professors, not just you know, tourism specialists and, and others, but you could even imagine people from Armidale working in those emerging regional communities and making money and employing people and setting up businesses. But to start with you have to connect and you've got to sort of get off your bottom and get out there and see if there's a way in which you could develop Asia's regional uh, business community. Sounds crazy but I spent a lot of time in these places. So I think this communication point and digitalisation point and as I say, think IoT, think ICT, don't think IT anymore, because IT is just computers and cables. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Thank you uh, sorry. We have a couple of really quick questions from the floor. Otherwise, we can take questions that go offline. I'm sure you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I know I can stay around a while. Yeah, yeah, I can't. I've got to. Um, Yeah, oh, uh, in spades, in, abs in absolute spades. So, yeah, so broadband penetration is just under 100%. Just under 100%, right? So when I, um, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just part of your life. So when I leave the office at night, from the car, I turn on the heating at home or the air conditioning at home. I turn the security system off. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just part of your life. It's just what you do. You become so. I check where, how the traffic's going. You know, the machine will tell me the best way to go home to avoid, to avoid the traffic. Um, more people read the media online than anywhere else in the world, including the US and Europe. So communities. Uh, Again, in you know, that perspiration period, the 1980s, Korea was called the Hermit Kingdom. Hated foreigners, didn't know what, it's a bit like North Korea now, right? Didn't know what was going on. Actually, the best way to look at what's happened is compare North and South. I've been to North Korea. It's terrible. I mean, it's just awful. People are starving and stuff, but... So one of the, one of the reasons that the Korea was able to sort of was to become an international economy, because it's as big as our economy now and overtaking it, was the people became educated on the rest of the world. So this point about education is really important. You can, people were able to see what the rest of the world was doing. And then that led to this sort of enormous exodus of people going overseas at one point to study, and they still do it, particularly for, for postgraduate. So, you know, I sort of chuckle when a couple of years ago I was reading stuff here about the government having a program to put computers in schools. Like, that's yesterday. That's, you know, that's a long way. So, I look. I was asking a question about that. Um, the NBN thing in Australia is very political. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably a lot more so than it should be. Mm. And you have one side rolling it out and the other side saying they're going back to and all that sort of thing. How do you, yeah. what's your strategy for coping with that sort of, mm. I don't know, reductionist policy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, look, this came up out at UNE and, ah, gee, unfortunately, Australian politics, I mean, what, what can you say? I mean, the, 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 thing, the thing about, the, the, like, the thing about these people, you know, these people in Korea and China and other countries, they're ambitious, you know, they, we, the, 
the issue we've got here is if we really step back a long, long way, and what, what is it that influences the politicians? Is we're a country of lotus eaters. We're, you know, we've got all this coal, we've got all this iron ore, we've got all this agricultural product, we've got uranium, right? Uranium's the next big thing. And, and so we forget that a country's greatest natural resource is its people. Now, the Koreans have got no choice because they don't have the coal or the iron ore. You know, they haven't, can't grow enough rice and stuff to feed themselves. So they know that their greatest natural resource is their people. So the political system, which is why it tends to work hand in hand with government and communities, the political system is all focused on survival and desperation. And how do we, how do we prosper, how do we grow? And the Koreans will often say, how do we get better than the Japanese, right? Because there's, yeah. there's a long history there. Japan occupied Korea for 100 years. So it's that, it's that drive that comes from wanting to be successful and the desperation of having to be. So the, politi the political situation is more about arguing on the margins rather than the fundamentals. And it's, you know, obviously all politicians score points from each other and that's part of the job description, right? But when it comes to these matters of national economy, national security, they tend to be much more focused on what's good for the economic and social, social outcome of, of the country. Mm. John, how are they addressing that the issue that I just saw um, in the media in the last couple of months? This emphasis on Bali Bali and, and excellence and mm. competition, they've got one of the highest in suicide rates in yep. Asia now. And yep. kids doing 15 hours of school in a day. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. highly competitive. Yeah. Is it, how are they addressing that? Because that's sort of a little bit of a backbite, because that's the next generation yep. coming yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a big concern because it's this issue of um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the issue, this issue of success. So you th the country has developed so rapidly. You know, as I said in the eighties, per capita GDP less than the Philippines. The Philippines is still where it always was. It's come up slightly, and the Koreans are now at sort of twenty thousand US, you know, per per, per capita. So I think. I think one of the issues that's developed is that there's, you know, your economic success now is sort of everything in a way. So in a sense, they've been too successful in, you know, no longer becoming a developing country. Uh, the other thing is this Confucian uh, culture. And in a Confucian culture, uh, all is forgiven when you're dead, particularly if you kill yourself. Yeah, so you saw the, the, the president before last, President No, committed suicide post his presidency because he was you know, caught doing something corrupt and his family was involved. So the only way he could exonerate his family was committing suicide. So I think, I think the sort of the short answer is much more uh, financial pressure, uh, a much more of feeling that if you haven't sort of you know, if you haven't become a multi-millionaire by the time you're 35, you've failed. Or if you've been caught doing something wrong. And there's much more of that happening with the sort of the move, the very aggressive anti-corruption move over the last decade. A lot of these people that are killing themselves have been very naughty. I mean, Rodney Adler went to jail, he didn't kill himself. In Korea, you would kill yourself before you went to jail. Yeah. So, but it is a big, it is a big social problem. And, and also the other problem is uh, indebtedness. So I think the indebtedness household levels in Korea are very similar to Australia, but they take it much more seriously. Because if, so if you can't pay your mortgage, you do think about killing yourself. We don't do that, right? We just don't pay it. Or, you know, we find some other, we, we find some other way of doing it. One of the, one of the big negatives on Korea is it hasn't developed a good social safety net. Right, so, and we have, right? So, and again, if you've got a country which hasn't got a good social safety net, um, that presents more of those pressures. And then the final one is unfortunately the breakdown of the extended families. So traditionally, you know, 
the extend, extended families all lived together and looked after each other. What's happened now with this, this aggressive move to capitalisation, capitalism, is that uh, a lot of the kids don't want mum and dad living with them anymore when they get older. So, uh, and, and under the, con also under the Confucian system, this is a very long answer to your question, but it is very complex. Under the Confucian system, there's a thing called hoju. Ironically, hoju means Australian too. But mm -hmm. under this hoju system, uh, the, the, the parents give the assets to the children before they die. So when you're older, you don't have any assets anymore. This has traditionally been the case, it's changing too. So if you combine that with the fact you've given everything away to your kids and then they desert you and you've got nothing left, it puts huge pressure on. It's huge pressure on. Yeah, so I mean, the, uh, my family foundation also supports a charity that looks after older people living by themselves, particularly older women. Uh, a lot of the men die before the women because they drink so much. Another similarity to Australia, right? A lot of, the, a lot of, but the, the men just drink a lot of hard, 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 hard liquor. So there's a lot of those different social forces at, at, at play. Now, I've just got a question before I finish because I'm going to get wound up. Having listened to everything that I've said, and this is kind of a quiz and there's a prize. That there's, I, I started the lecture the other day with this question and so people that were there are not allowed to participate in answering it. I was uh, two years ago in Abu Dhabi at a global business conference organised by Mubadala, who are one of the big uh, investment funds in the UAE. And there's a very famous author that wrote a book called The Black Swan which was an analysis of what happened in the global financial crisis. And he'd, he'd just written a new book, and the book was called Anti-Fragile. And it was an analysis of financial systems and what made them work. And he was telling me about something he's got in the book. And the question that he poses in the book is, what's the difference between a washing machine and a cat? So what's the difference between a washing machine and a cat? Anyone want to have a stab at the answer? Got a great prize here. Oh, cat lovers might disagree with you. Got a great prize here. Got a great prize here. Uh, anyone else want to have a go at it? If you're here with the last talk, does it still count? Sorry? If you're here with the last talk, does the answer still count? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Sorry, mate. Sorry. Well, look, look. What a, having, having, having heard what I've said, I guess if you think about it. But the the thing, the thing that resonated with me about the, so obviously, a cat is organic, and a washing machine is inorganic. Now, the thing about inorganic things. Well, the more you use them, the more they wear out, yeah. right? So you buy, you know, the best possible washing machine you can. You use it every day, but clink, clink, and you use it three times a day, four times a day, its lifetime reduces. The thing about a cat is if it doesn't move, if it doesn't use its muscles, if it doesn't flex itself, it dies. So they're quite, at two different extremes, right? One, the more you use it more quickly it goes. The other, if you don't use it, you die. And, and the reason I pose that question, it's a bit like this issue of, you know, you've got the broadband, you've got ideas, you've got niche products, and you've got all of these things, but you've got to actually be out there using them and trialling them and facing the optionality. It's not just going to be good enough to rely on that clunky bit of technology you know, you're just going to wear out if you just. If, so you if, need if, to have kittens. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's called innovation. Many kittens. <laughs> and that's innovation. So I don't know who. who, who you, you had the first stab at answering, so you can have my CD. There we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. All, all, of, all, of, all of the money from these CDs is called 12 Bridges. All of the money goes to support the Philippines Red Cross and also a charity in Korea for old people that live by themselves. Later this year there's going to be a new album out. It's going to be called Waiting for the Rain. 
and I wrote all of the songs in Armadale. So maybe we'll have a launch party or something. Yeah, can we do it? At the shop? Yeah, that'd be great. With the guitar you guys gave me. I know Ollie very well, yeah. It, is he still running the the yes, the government thing, the yes, environmental right. agency? Yeah. He's he's keeping his name out of the media. No, he's not. I have, well, I haven't seen his name. I've seen the issues, but no, yeah, not. I know Ollie very well. Oh, all right. All right. I'll read that digitally tonight. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thank you so much, John. That was a fantastic presentation, oh. and it's um, your insights and your experience and this whole journey of um, well, your personal journey, but sharing with us this, this whole potential of engineering and what we, what we have to do with the team in Armadale. So thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, oh, oh, thank you. Um, wow. Local wine, Tempranillo, wow, oh, right. Mm. Where is this from? Yarrala or? Um, yeah. Kingstown. Just down there. Kingstown, oh, right.